Hi, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, uh, wherever you are now. My name is Rafael Groman. I'm an assistant professor of critical platform and data studies at University of Toronto in Canada, and this is DigiLabor YouTube channel. Uh, this week, we will have two online book talks uh, to, tonight with Inacio Siles and, and Friday with uh, Sahana Udupa uh, on uh, digital colonialism. And uh, tonight we'll have an uh, online book talk with Inasso Silas. Uh, hello, Inasso, how are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for the invitation and for uh, receiving me. Great. Uh, I will present in, in, in English, Portuguese, and Spanish uh, the bio of uh, Inasso Silas, and then uh, the conversation will be in English but feel free to reach out us in English, Portuguese, or Spanish, and, and we can translate here uh, uh, for you. So uh, Ignacio Silis is a professor in the School of Communication at the Uni University of Costa Rica and a researcher at the, Center of Res the Research Center in Communication and SAM Institution, and he got a PhD in Media Technology and Society at North Western University and Masters in Communications from the University of Montreal here in Canada. And he just launched today the book Living with Algorithms, Agency and User Culture in Costa Rica by MIT Press. So this is really a pleasure to, to receive and to talk to Inas about that. And the book examines the personal relationships that have formed between users and algorithms as Latin Americans have integrated the systems into the structures of the everyday life. Sometimes users follow algorithms, uh, sometimes users resist them, at times users do both, and the agencies lie in the navigation of the spaces in between, and in analyze that analyze what we do with algorithms rather than what algorithms do with us. Uh, so in, in, in Portuguese, uh, Inácio Silas é, é, um, é um professor é, da Escola de Comunicação da, da Universidade de Costa Rica, pesquisador do Centro de Investigação em Comunicação na mesma instituição e está lançando hoje o livro Vivendo com Algoritmos, Agência e Cultura de Usuários na Costa Rica, falando em geral como é que a gente, o que a gente faz com os algoritmos a partir de uma pesquisa realizada na, na Costa Rica é, e em vez de o que, que os algoritmos fazem é, com a gente. E, e algo com um, um, um portunhol, Inácio Silas é um professor de, de, de Escola de, de Comunicação de, de, na Universidade de Costa Rica e investigador a Centro de Investigação e Comunicação em la mesma instituição e lançando hoje o livro Vivendo com os Algoritmos, analisando o que fazemos com, algorit com algoritmos em vez de somente que e, 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 eles fazem com nós. Uh, so, welcome, Inácio, and please uh, present your brand new book to us uh, uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, I'll share my screen, and I trust you let me know if it's not working properly. Okay, so thank you so much again for the invitation. It really is an honor uh, to be here, and the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, uh, it is today the, the official date in which uh, this book is being um, of, pu published. So as Rafael was saying, uh, my interest in this project is um, to try to in re reverse what I think has been the dominant or uh, analytical approach to understand the relationship between algorithms and, and people. So instead of asking what algorithms do to people, I'm interested in understanding what people do with algorithms. Um, and so the way I do this is by looking at how people in Costa Rica establish certain relationships with uh, the algorithmic recommendations of three specific platforms, namely Netflix, Spotify, and, and TikTok. Um, and of course, by, by looking at what people do with algorithms, my argument is not that we should take for granted or even accept what these platforms are doing, or what these companies are doing, right? And the way they extract data from people. That's really not what, what I'm trying to argue, but rather that whatever we take this notion or this field of critical data studies to be, uh, my argument is that we need to pay attention to what people uh, are doing as opposed to 
assuming uh, what their experiences are with these platforms. So my starting question is this one, right? Uh, what does it mean to live in a datafied society and an era of algorithmic platforms? And I'm guessing it is really not necessary to uh, find examples of how prevalent algorithms have become in our relationship with, with, with media today, right? They seem to be everywhere and they seem to be shaping most of our interactions with, with platforms uh, nowadays. Um, so these questions to me are important because they allow us to really understand what agency means in the present context. Uh, it, it allows us also to, to update our conversations on what agency means in the context of our interactions with platforms uh, governed or shaped by algorithmic recommendations. So I think there have been two important ways in which this uh, answer and in, in which these questions has, has been answered. The first one sort of emphasizes the power of algorithms. And here I'm following uh, use, uh, scholars' own conceptual preferences. When they talk about algorithms, scholars have referred to this as power. And when they have talked about people, they have preferred the notion of, of agency. So the first question, the first answer to my question sort of emphasizes how algorithms have power in themselves, right? And I think for everyone who's familiar with the history of communication and media studies, this image says it all, right? This idea that algorithms are the new version of a hypodermic needle, um, that it is just a power, it's just, it, it sort of, materializes a computational capacity that is way too much for, for the human brain. So in this view, uh, power resides precisely in the algorithms themselves. Other people have um, sort of answered this question in a somewhat different way. And rather than suggesting that algorithms have the power, they have argued instead that all the power resides in the networks or in the assemblages uh, in, from which algorithms uh, are a part and also help shape. So here again, uh, the power is not in algorithms themselves, but rather in these assemblages that algorithms help shape as well. And a third way to sort of uh, that, I, that I frame under this idea of uh, algorithmic power is the idea of uh, algorithms intersecting with broader forms of technological or of, of power that already operate and exist in society. So here the idea is not so much that algorithms have power, but rather that they help magnify and even um, expand um, existing forms of power that, ha that have operated in, in society for a long time. So that's the first way of answering my research question, this idea that algorithms have power. And even if I think that they have made very valuable contribution, contributions to our understanding of, of the present moment uh, that we live in, I also think that uh, this body of work has been limited in two important ways. The first one is this, tend I think there's a sort of a, a, a contradiction or a paradox in the way these ideas of algorithmic culture uh, sort of operate, right? Um, because for the most part, it's algorithms uh, operating in culture, but really not, no culture whatsoever operating uh, on algorithms. So for the most part, I feel like algorithms have been depicted as these external forces that affect places that really have no history and people that barely have any context. And the other shortcoming, I argue, is that there, there's the risk of reproducing uh, deterministic accounts that render people into pass passive victims of, of new forms of technological power. So when we situate this historically, um, we can realize that we have already been in this position, right? It's not the first time that we hear about hypodermic needles and, and uh, forms of technological power that overpower the human brain, right? So the counter argument that I often get when I mention this is that, well, uh, datafication is somewhat of a different beast, right? It's different from other forms of media power that, that we have known in the past because it's much more pervasive. So what I argue in this project is that even if that is the case, we should treat that more as an empirical uh, question rather than a premise, right? It's not, it, that might perfectly be the case, but it should be a result of our empirical investigations of what people and how they relate to algorithms as opposed to assuming uh, from the get-go that it is a form of power that overpowers uh, humans in any way. The second way of responding my research question has been uh, emphasizing instead not the power of algorithms, but the agency that humans still have in this context. And also there have been three ways of emphasizing this. The first one emphasizes these this, um, mostly cognitive issues. That, that is how people, even if they don't know what an algorithm is, they can still sort of develop their own awareness and their knowledge and even their theories or imaginaries of what is going on behind uh, those black or inside those black boxes of algorithms. Um, so here the idea is 
um, even if we don't understand, we can still develop some form of understanding of what's going on uh, that shapes how we behave with these platforms. For other scholars, the idea has been that agency is expressed through, a, through affect, right? So, through the ways in which we feel uh, through algorithms and the intensities in which we feel what we feel through algorithms. So these approaches rather emphasize issues of, of certain attitudes and how we develop certain attitudes in relation to, to algorithms and how we use them uh, to cultivate certain, certain affect. And the third um, strand of research within this uh, emphasis on user agency has been mostly this idea of practice, that what matters or for understanding agency is what people actually do in relation to algorithms. And perhaps the, the privileged object of study here has been uh, how gig workers, for example, uh, enact some forms of resistance to algorithms in the way they they uh, they behave in their practices, um, and also there has been this emphasis on on social movements. Uh, so what we're left here is with this dual scenario in which some people emphasize how algorithms are shaping society, and other people emphasize how uh, users sort of enact algorithmic recommendations as they incorporate them into their daily life. So the argument I'm making in the book is that we could also treat this um, to different issues as sort of a simultaneous occurrences as opposed to having to choose between one of them. But that forces us to recognize that agency is much more fluid uh, than what we have been saying in our studies of, of algorithmic platforms. Um, so that's pretty much the argument of the book, right? That I think there's these two issues going on and that we don't necessarily need to choose, but that both are occurring in the way in which people relate to algorithms, sometimes enacting forms of resistance and sometimes uh, letting themselves be domesticated, so to speak, uh, by these platforms. So let me just very briefly unpack what I mean by domestication. If you're from the field of communication studies, as I am, you're very familiar with this term, and it, the, the popularity comes mostly from the work of Roger Silverstone way back in the 1990s, and how he studied how people sort of incorporate television into their lives. So more, more than a straightforward application of Silverstone's work to the case of algorithms, what I'm following him is in this idea that we need to pay attention to how certain people sort of appropriate these um, uh, different art artifacts and incorporate them into the spaces and times, into their own culture, um, in very specific ways. Um, so that's the first sort of cue that I take from, from the work of Silverstone. The second one is mostly this idea that we need some sort of a theoretical intervention. And Silverstone uh, sort of reacted against uh, what he felt, I guess, was sort of a, a, a two theoretical extremes in the study of television, for example. On the one hand, Frankfurt School, and on the other hand, um, sort of this emphasis on, on the brilliance of consumers. And so he, he was trying to pretty much counterbalance this to uh, dominant theoretical extremes. And I think there's something similar that we can sort of learn and do in the case of algorithms by trying to counterbalance the extremes of conceiving of algorithmic power and human agency as independent from each other. Another a theoretical idea that I'd like to incorporate into this project is um, the way James, James Carey and um, conceived of communication as culture. And I think there's something very interesting here in the way uh, he framed communication as uh, these means to which certain realities are brought into, into existence and are, are constructed and apprehended and, 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 and sort of repaired and maintained. So I think we could also apply this idea to the case of algorithms in ways that are consistent with what Nick Sieber has argued a couple of years ago, namely the idea that algorithms are also a way of enacting certain realities. And so that's pretty much the, the task that I set out for this book. What if we treat people's relationship with, uh, with algorithms as a way to bring uh, a particular reality or different realities into existence? I think this is very consistent too with, with um, the popular theory of uh, communication developed in Latin America over the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, and what I, what I value from this approach is that they already in the 1980s sort of started to move to a more, more fluid understanding of agency, one in which, you know, uh, they could, people could reflect both submission and resistance against different forms of power in the same action. So that's another piece of theoretical um, work that I'd like to incorporate in, into my project. So what exactly did I do in this project? And I'll be very, very brief here because I think we can discuss uh, this uh, in the q and if you, if you like. Uh, but the premise here was that people don't relate to just one platform in their lives, but when it comes to study how people relate to platforms, we tend to focus on one single platform at a time. So the premise for me was that 
uh, if I wanted to understand how people live with algorithms, I needed to study how they related to a variety of, of different platforms. And, and this has been recognized in the literature through notions such as polymedia or uh, media environments and, and media ecologies and so on and so forth. Uh, so I ended up using this very basic premise and interview people, then sort of invited a, a bunch of other people to talk about their social understanding of algorithms in relation to other people in focus groups. I asked them to uh, sort of drew or graphically represent how they understood what algorithms were. I actually never used the term algorithm until and unless someone, uh, some, some of my interviewees and interlocutors mentioned it themselves. So as soon as they did, I started to ask more questions about what they understood about this, but I didn't use the word algorithms until they did so. And the final technique that I did was to ask a bunch of, of, of participants who had never used uh, TikTok in particular to, to share with me daily reports over a month of their experiences with these platforms. Again, I'll be happy to talk about more about the research design um, in the Q&A if, uh, if you would like to do that. And so I'm gonna skip just a couple of these and try just to contextualize why uh, Costa Rica, I think, is a very good case for doing uh, this project. And the basic idea is that, of course, these platforms are growing um, a lot in Latin America, perhaps more than in many other places in the world, uh, and that there's something very interesting going on in, in the country. So I started, illustrating this uh, by uh, showing you here a couple of screenshots from uh, newspapers in the 1990s, uh, the moment where Intel, the manufacturer, um, opened in Costa Rica, one of the largest um, you know, factories in, in the world. So I think that changed uh, Costa Rica's history, not only economically as foreign direct investment has become, after tourism, the second most important source of income in the country, um, but also culturally. Uh, so I think that shaped the way Costa Ricans relate to Costa Rica, uh, to technology, and started to think of technology as a way of imagining their, their cultural identity. So nowadays, Costa Rica is not only um, the, the first um, high tech exporter in Latin America. And of course, every statistic with, with Costa Rica in particular is uh, per capita, as it is a very a small country, but it also is uh, the heaviest social media user uh, in Latin America or comparable to most of the biggest countries in the region. Uh, so it's, it is the largest Facebook user and one of the largest uh, WhatsApp users, I think. Uh, sim very, statistics here are very similar to the case of Brazil, for example. So that's the context in, in which I conducted my, my research. Um, and so here are the five dynamics that I um, explore in the book, which uh, I argue this is, this is what living with algorithms uh, mean in, in practice, right? I won't go through all of them in very specific ways as yeah, we have a very limited time, but also because I do want you to read the book. Uh, but very briefly, I'd like to just say one thing about each one of these dynamics and then um, pass the, the mic to, to Rafael. Um, so the first one is this idea of personalization. And here, what I try to uh, problematize is this idea that personalization, what it actually means is that people are willing to give all their data uh, in order to receive personalized recommendation. Uh, so what I argue in the book is that uh, personalization is much more than that. It's, it, it's the establishment of a personal relationship with algorithms. And as you can see here in the slide, uh, what I try to do as instead of tying this dynamic to one specific platform, what I do is to show how it manifests or how it is expressed or how you can learn different aspects of this dynamic by focusing on one specific platform. Uh, so in the book, I go uh, more detail in, in how this relationship, an evolving relationship is established to, with algorithms and that, how that works as a much better understanding of what personalization means than just assuming that people are willing to give all their data uh, to platforms uh, because they want to receive personal recommendations. So the second, oh, sorry about that. The second dynamic that I explore in the book is this idea of integration. And here where, what I want to problematize is this idea that algorithms shape all of our choices. Uh, instead, what I argue in the book is that algorithms don't work entirely alone and they really don't erase the structures of everyday life. Instead, what I think is going on is that people integrate in algorithms in order in their daily lives in order to achieve uh, a variety of cultural capacities. And I illustrate this and even in even relationships with other people and I illustrate this with different um, aspects in, in each platform. So here with the idea of ritual, 
uh, what I want to problematize is this idea of, of platformization, of locating power in platforms themselves. And here I sort of invert this argument by following um, the lead of Nick Kuldry's work in the 2000s decade, uh, where he sort of argued that a much more productive way of understanding what power means is by following people's rituals and how through these rituals people act out power and the centrality of media. So he talked about <clears throat> the myth of the mediated center. And I think there's just something similar going on, uh, but instead of mediated center, we should call this the myth of the platform center uh, and how platformization sort of offers us uh, a, a way into understanding how, pro how power works. So I argue here that ritual is a much more productive way of understanding the issues of power than platforms themselves. So conversion, I, I analyze it in the pretty much the same way that Roger Silverstone used the term, namely how the private consumption of a platform is transformed into a public issue. So here I focus specifically on how people sort of articulate the self to others through algorithms and sort of connect the self to algorithms through others. So even if uh, people consume individually platforms, it is always by implementing or developing a conception of the public, a, a broader conception of how their co private consumption of the, of the platform occurs in a much wider public uh, space. And the final dynamic that I explore in the book is um, resistance, right? Uh, this idea that um, people not only follow algorithms, but also resist them. But here I, in the book, I don't follow specifically on how people try to change um, datafication as a system or even the operation of these platforms, but I rather situate the resistance efforts in what uh, some scholars have termed uh, the domain of the infrapolitical. So that is, particular practices that don't necessarily have political articulation, but that are ways of expressing issues of autonomy and identity and even a political view of, of life in the relationship with these platforms. So here, the basic premise is that, of course, algorithms are um, biased, but that people are able and capable and of identifying some of those biases and that that resistance to those biases is a fundamental way of relating to these platforms. So just to conclude and perhaps open the conversation, um, uh, my basic argument is that it's something that there's something to be gained by looking at how specifically people relate to platforms as opposed to use platforms themselves or even tech companies or even tech producers or software developers as our intellectual or analytical starting point. Right? There's something that we can gain by looking at how people relate to this um, algorithms in daily life that don't necessarily, uh, is, is not necessarily uh, obvious when we focus on, on other issues. And the other thing that I'd like to um, sort of argue here is that we need to update our understanding of what agency means, right? So as Rafael was saying at the beginning uh, of the presentation, right, uh, users follow algorithms and sometimes users resist them, but agency is precisely uh, navigating those in the spaces in between. So here the in between is a way of, of, of a much more productive way of understanding what agency means in relation to these platforms. One that does not force us to sort of choose between algorithmic power or human agency, but that actually invites us to understand how both of those realities exist in the same actions at the same time. So I think I can stop here. Uh, if you think okay, that's, that gives us uh, enough material to talk, um, and thanks a lot for your attention. So thank you so much, Anastasia, for your very insightful presentation. Looking forward to read your your brand new book, uh, Living with Algorithms. Uh, I have uh, I will start with the question from the audience. And so after I have like four or five or ten questions for you. Uh, Guilherme Martin Batista uh, is asking, uh, Good night, Nacio. Thanks for this lecture. I have a question I'd ask myself during my, the entire master's degrees. Why do we, Latin Americans, align our identity so deeply with these platforms? Or is it the perception that still need analysis? Thank you so much for, for this question. I think this is an, an excellent uh, question indeed. When I was sort of doing the archival part of the project to sort of contextualize how these three platforms that I studied had developed in the region over the past decade and or so. I did notice that this idea that Latin Americans are um, intrinsically more open to platforms was some was was an idea that was put, put forth consistently by these platforms. So there's uh, a very 
important work done by these platforms to emphasize precisely this idea that there's something in us Latin Americans that leads us um, to, to these platforms because we're intrinsically um, open or we're intrinsically happy or we're intrinsically and they have sort of capitalized consistently over the past decade um, by emphasizing this idea there's something in us that leads us to this but i think we of course we need to pay uh, to problematize this this sort of ideas and and a, a good or a useful way to do so is to sort of look at it as a as a tension right or as a friction between on the one hand sort of localizing our relationships with these platforms and sort of force them to comply with our local rules of interaction and at the same time uh, to try to understand how they force us um, to experience global conversations uh, about music technology and culture and i think this tension is going on all the time ways in which we express very latin american or brazilian or costa rican um, attitudes or cultural norms in the way we relate to these technologies but at the same time um, we use them or people use them to sort of try to live a very global experience of, of culture nowadays uh, so i think that tension between the local and the global is much more productive than assuming that there's something in us that leads us to um, this platform, because that's something that has been capitalized consistently by these platforms and that they, uh, it's a discourse that they uh, keep insisting on and that they want to uh, make everyone believe it's it's happening. I hope I, I was able to answer your, your question. Great, thank, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, let's see what Claire could tell us. So my first question for you is more empirical one, uh, uh, and then I have another others on theory and, and methods. Uh, it's about TikTok. Uh, I, I was very curious because you started your research in 2017 until 2022, um, and TikTok uh, uh, emerged as a, a like a, as a powerful platform in Brazil, especially during the pandemic, like 2020. And so uh, maybe during your research, you, you saw this platform growing up uh, um, with the everyday life of, of Costa Rican uh, users. So I'd like to, to, to see uh, it's about how was your uh, ex research experiences with TikTok users considering the beginning and the end of your research? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So the way I conceived of my research design or the way I planned for everything was to start with one platform, then move to another platform and then go back to the first platform. So findings from one project would sort of feed on uh, the following ones. And so um, I started with Netflix and then uh, once I had done something with there with, with Netflix users in the country, then I started to talk to Spotify users, um, then went back to Netflix users trying to Sort of fostered this this idea that findings from one project could help me identify things uh, in other platforms that i wouldn't have noticed um, um if had i decided to do you know uh, everything at, at, at once um so originally i had thought about doing um the third study or the third part of the study with instagram but then my students convinced me that uh TikTok was a much better platform and i'm very grateful to them because uh they they were they were really sort of telling me you know don't do it about instagram TikTok is the the third platform of your study and i was like yeah maybe maybe they do have maybe they they that makes sense to me so what i did was of course i left that for the final part of the research project but what Having done that, I do feel there was a difference between the beginning and the end. And I don't know if it's related to the platform or um, the trajectory or, t or the issue of time. Um, namely, the difference was that when it came to studying TikTok users, um, people would, within minutes of into the conversation, they would mention the word algorithm and they would say things such as, you know, TikTok's algorithm is uh, the most aggressive of them all. And this is the most addictive app I have ever used. So. Either there was something in the app that led them to this sort of awareness, or time had passed between the beginning of the study and the end um, that led them that led them to be a little bit more aware of of of, uh, of the notion of algorithms altogether, or even um, that uh, these platforms were driven by something that is called algorithms. Um, so yeah, time was a a, a big uh, and and I couldn't answer which one of those two uh, factors were. I think maybe uh, a combination of both. 
Um, but there's definitely something uh, different in the experience that people report when it comes to TikTok as opposed to the other platforms that I studied. Great, thank you so much. We have another one more question from the audience. Thank you, there is Mila Flores Marquez. Uh, ask, uh, thank you so much, Ignacio. Very interesting and clear. Could you expand on the idea of resistance? Are they displayed in tactics? How aware are the users about this resistance? Hola, Doris. Thank you for uh, for being here, and I send you a big abrazo uh, a la distancia. So um, that's a very interesting question. So uh, again, my approach here is to focus on instances of what I would call infrapolitical resistance. Namely, these are not practices or tactics that people deploy to change the system. It, it, it's not the same. I mean, my approach is not the same to what scholars in the collective actions uh, movement and, and the study of social movements have employed here. Uh, for some people, uh, this might be called even decaf resistance. Namely, it's not the real thing because it doesn't lead to transformations in the system. However, I would argue that it is resistance precisely because for people, it is a way of articulating issues of autonomy in relation to this system, or even issues of identity in relation to this system. And this expressed or manifested differently in the case of um, each platform. For example, in the, case, in the case of Netflix, there was this idea that the platform kept pushing recommendations that were stereotypically ways of, of showing them that the platform considered them consumer profiles as opposed to people. Uh, so people would say things like, well, this platform might have a bunch of content, but I only get recommendations from narco, soccer, football, or telenovelas. Uh, and that expressed to them this idea that, well, um, there's, there's something going on. There's a bias here uh, that reflects a stereotypical way of understanding uh, who Latin Americans are, for example. There was also this idea that uh, people complain about not having the same uh, access to the same content available in other parts of the world, namely the United States. So, for example, uh, they were happy to have access to Luis Miguel La Serie, but they really wanted to watch The Office because that's, once again, the idea that access to these recommendations and access to this uh, content allows them to be a part of a global conversation about uh, series, uh, culture, and, 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 and music, for example. So this idea of wanting to live a global experience through algorithms was very important in how they resisted certain aspects of, 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 of Netflix, for example. And they would go and use VPNs or um, try to, to game the system in order to receive the same recommendations that we get uh, had they been in the US, for example. And the premise was that, was that uh, I pay the same price that other people in the global north pay, but I don't have access to the same content. And therefore I feel excluded. So uh, to me, uh, this matters because unlike other notions to make sense of this, uh, such as uh, data colonialism, for example, um, here the tensions and the differences between the global north and the global south are crucial for understanding people's relationship to algorithms. And that's why I considered resistance. And so resistance also happens in the case of Spotify, for example, when people start feeling that the platform only wants to make them paying customers and then use algorithms to force them to become paying customers, as opposed to just use the app for free, but have having to listen to ads. So here the common comment was that I don't mind ads when the ads advertise something, but here ads don't have advertise anything. They're just a way to annoy you so you become, for example, a paying customer. And there was also resistance in the case of TikTok, for example, uh, in, that manifested in a very interesting sort of paradox of people wanting that the platform deleted content that were, was being promoted uh, and promote content that was being deleted. Um, so there's this very interesting tension between uh, the content that people feel the platform should be giving them, but it's not available to them, uh, and how it provides content to them that they wouldn't want to be emphasized in the first place. This is very interesting, Inacio, um, in terms of, uh, I just moved to Canada four months ago, and, and Toronto is, a very cosmopolitan city, and my students are many of, of them international students and teaching social media and platform studies. And saying, you know, okay, what do you use? Uh, yeah, do you use VPN or how you connect with your uh, of your origin country in 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 that terms? This is really interesting, and 
the way that users like game with the system. And for me, it, 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 I totally understand your approach on resistance from like a Stuart Hall classical uh, approach in terms of uh, resistance readings and, and also from this uh, cultural studies tradition. And, and, and my, my next question is about that. I clearly see your, your work um, as like one good example uh, about the future of the audience studies and the cultural studies. And I, I'm training uh, myself on audience and reception, Estudios de Recepción uh, uh, from Latin America. And I saw this kind of studies that were more focused on television in, in 90s uh that they don't have like a clear agenda for uh, algorithms and platforms or how to do and how to theorize um and i, I know that is not only the, the the question but i saw like roger silverstone and nick codry and martin barbero as three uh foundational authors to think about rituals and all this stuff regarding like media in everyday life in in that sense so i'd like to to know from you a little bit about uh how uh, uh was your path uh, in relation to audience studies and how do you feel after this 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 research like uh, building on this uh, classical uh, concepts from audience and cultural studies and your own contribution to that yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question, too. So so first, a comment on the Stuart Hall's um, model and the way it has been applied to the case of algorithms, because I do think some people have started to look at uh, Stuart Hall's classic model encoding, decoding as a way to make sense of how users establish a relationship with algorithms. So here, in the way it in, ha it w in which it has been applied is by suggesting that people engage in either one of these three dynamics of decoding. So. Although I think that's part of it, I also would like to move a step further by suggesting it's not that people choose one way of decoding algorithms, it's that people do all three at once. Uh, they do negotiate and follow and resist and oppose algorithms all the time at one, in the same actions even. Um, so I do think it's a valuable framework, but as long as we remember that it's not that we choose one of those three uh, ways of decoding, but we do all three of them at once. Uh, and so I definitely was trying to build on, um, you know, the work of audience uh, researchers, uh, because I don't think that every new technology leads us to erase uh, every single theory we already have. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's the way uh, knowledge should work. Uh, I think that there are valuable re lessons that we can draw from uh, work that was done in other moments in history uh, and that sought to make sense of how people related to other technologies in, in history. But having said that, I don't think either that these theories have all, all have figured out uh, entirely um, how these new technologies uh, sort of operate. So it's not about, you know, just incorporate using what we already know from the 1980s and the 1990s and sort of straightforwardly uh, apply it to every new technology that we get. I don't find that exciting or stimulating either. So what I think we should do is engage in these critical dialogues in which we look at what uh, concepts and ideas uh, previous theories can give us and sort of also try to make sense of the challenges that new technologies pose to these ideas. So um, Silverstone, for example, emphasized this idea of domestication, but I think there's something going on, right? Because in Silverstone's, uh, for example, theory, it is media that is the object of domestication. But here I am arguing that when you look at the case specifically or algorithms, then people also become the subject of domestication. So it makes sense to sort of explore people's relationship with these artifacts within this uh, tension created by uh, these new technological uh, platforms. So it's always looking at what other people have done, but also trying to understand what challenges these new uh, scenarios and realities create for the knowledge that we have. Uh, but I fundamentally don't think that those theories, theories should be discarded just because they were created in the 1980s or the 1990s or the 2000s decade, uh, and we have new technologies. Um, that might be the case, but again, we need to test that empirically rather than assume it uh, from the beginning. Great. This is really good. 
inspiring to uh, think about this these issues. And another very interesting thing uh, uh, I noticed in, in your presentation is about this more nuanced uh, um, way to think about platformization or to react to um, platformization as a, a process, like a top-down uh, process. And in your uh, uh, comparison with the the, the media. Um, I forgot the, the name of, of Nick Codry, like the the myth of media centric or the myth of now platform centric. And this is so interesting because uh, uh, two weeks ago or like 10, 10 days ago, uh, I had a conversation in uh, Brazil, Philippines about disinformation in Brazil and Philippines in, in this like global south approaches. And one of the, the, the main results of this conversation uh, was we need more uh, uh, more uh, we need less platform centric approach to understand this information and 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 for me maybe if this is uh, a kind of majority word contribution to uh, platform studies in, the, in this uh, in the, like this platform centric uh, um, perspective or in a more nuanced way to understand. I would like to, to, to know more from you if you uh, have uh, 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 if you have described in a more nuanced way in the book properly about the notion of platformization, how you do you deal with, with it. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, too, uh, because you start to feel that in Latin America, more people are using this idea of platformization, not, not only the idea, but sort of the, the theories or um, the group of theories um, that people have employed to make sense of, of this process. And I think that's an important part of, of it, for sure. And to be clear, I, I, it's not that I want to replace the study of platforms altogether or to say, well, you know, platforms don't matter at all. I do think they matter, but that we need to sort of supplement the study of platform logics or platform dynamics or um, platformization as a process with uh, the way in which people sort of in their practices, in their daily lives, sort of act out the power that these platforms have in their lives. And you can see that um, sometimes the, the discourses put forth by these tech companies make sense to people, right? In the, in the case of, of Netflix, for example, the rituals that I studied um, we're very consistent with this idea emphasized through algorithms in the platform that what you're doing is an extension of what you have already done in the past because you watched it. Uh, and so people really, um, that, that really made sense to people and it became the, the key way in which people made sense of why they were receiving certain recommendations. So for them, it was pretty much obvious. It's because I watched something else in the past. So that justification of that rationale made sense to people and started to reproduce that um, in their practice, uh, but it's something that requires going beyond what platforms do. It requires to see how people adjust their daily lives for um, platforms uh, in, in certain times and through uh, in certain moments, in certain places, for example, using specific devices for, for conducting these rituals. In the case of, of TikTok, for example, the ritual was about escaping boredom which was sort of an, an, as something that people imposed on themselves. It was a need. They needed to get rid of boredom and the way, best way. This, of course, happened too during uh, the pandemic, in which people described their conditions as very uh, boring conditions. So they felt the obligation, the moral obligation to get rid of, of boredom. And so the way they did so was by engaging in specific rituals that occur in certain times of the day um, and that occur, um, you know, for, for, certain, for a certain period of time in which I argue they sort of act out the centrality of platforms in their daily lives. Um, and so in, in the case of Spotify, it was this idea of cultivating moods, uh, which became the central way uh, the, or, the, or the guiding principle of people's rituals. And they would create you know, all these playlists, for example, to capture the appropriate mood they wanted to capture. So people do relate to these platforms and platformization is an, an, an important part of the process, but it's not everything. It's not, not everything is, uh, is designed by platforms themselves, but rather people sort of enact or act out the, the, the power that these platforms have in their daily lives. Um, by following or believing in this myth of the platform center, that is that platforms give them you know, access uh, to, to a variety of emotions, a variety of, of interests, a variety of relationships 
Uh, and if you do follow that uh, ritually, then you act out this power of platforms. Uh, but I argue it's not, it's not only a matter of platforms. It, it really needs to be understood in the broader context of how those discourses make sense at, uh, and are sort of enacted ritually in the daily lives of, of people. Great. And, and even the, the use of hashtags as rituals like throwback Thursday, it's more Instagram than TikTok and no. And, and, and I remember this chill like Netflix and chill uh, and, and using like a, a, a playlist on Spotify about, okay, chill and the movies for you, Netflix and chill and how people can combine. This is very interesting to think about the rituals that, that, that people use. And uh, I had some students researching the closest friends on Instagram and how the people use uh, as ritual the closest friends uh, on Instagram to talk about some uh, uh, some issues and so on. So this is very interesting. My next question is about uh, your research design. Uh, first of all, you conducted many many uh, interviews and, and focus group. I imagine that. Uh, um, if you're going to do in the pandemic, most of them it's online. But especially, I'm interested in 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 know more about learn more about the one second because uh, yeah, the rich pictures and the the diverse uh, uh, methods. And if you can explain to us what was uh, this uh, this method methods and and. Yeah, this is the, the first method question for you. <laughs> sure, sure. No, uh, thank you for, for asking that. So, um, yes, I started by launching this call for participants and um, using social media profiles and a variety of other uh, techniques to um, draw people's attention to the study. <clears throat> and once people had responded, I my my main uh, sort of sampling criterion was try to build a, a diverse sample in terms of age, um, you know, ways they define their gender, the ways uh, socioeconomic, uh, in, economic income. Uh, so a variety of, of different uh, criteria. Um, I tried to build a diverse sample that will allow me to have access to a variety of experiences with these platforms. Um, so once people have responded to that, I asked them to come to campus. Uh, so I interviewed them. And during the interviews, of course, with their uh, permission, we projected on a screen their profiles, on, um, you know, th their Netflix profiles, for example. And so that allowed us to discuss very specific concrete recommendations as opposed to talk about algorithms in the abstract, which I didn't find was very useful. So we discussed specific re recommendations and specific practices um, that we could identify, you know, uh, in, in, in these uh, profiles that were being projected. And some people even shared their yeah, history, the, the history of the things that had watched on the platform or um, stuff like that. So, uh, and once we had done that, I started to ask them about, well, uh, what, how do you think you received this recommendation? How do you think recommendations work? Uh, sometimes people mentioned the word algorithms, but sometimes done, they didn't. So one thing that happened is that when you ask that question, so how do you think you received this? People would give you an explanation, but for the most part, an explanation that was relatively short. And so you would ask additional questions to try to you know, delve deeper on how they were understanding what was going on there. And sometimes that worked, but on other occasions, um, you really felt that uh, there was, you know, uh, um, they, they put sort of the stop sign very quickly. Like, I have nothing else to give you about that. So uh, one way of making obvious those explanations of algorithms that were not being made explicit or that were not being articulated was by asking them to drop how they thought these uh, systems were. So I borrowed this technique from uh, the field of conflict resolution. I had learned and read about the way they used it and uh, talking to a colleague who uh, I think had used it once for a very completely different project. I felt it was a good way precisely to make explicit all these ideas that people were not necessarily able to articulate. So I gave them a uh, paper, I gave them uh, pencils and a bunch of, of, of other uh, tools. And I asked them, you know, take the next, take the next 25 minutes or 30 minutes um, and graphically represent how you think this works. 
Uh, and so we would come back after 30 minutes and every person in the focus group would share how, uh, you know, would share their drawing and would explain to others their drawing. And I feel that was a, an excellent way of um, delving deeper into ideas that are not necessarily clear to people. That gave them time, that forced them to articulate these ideas uh, in a different way, in a way different than, you know, verbally um, explaining how algorithms work. And that also allowed us a way to triangulate um, the other kind of data I had. Uh, received. So in the end, I think it works very well. Of course, there are tools and, and even protocols to analyze the drawings. I didn't, I mean, I followed the lead of other researchers who have employed these methods uh, by trying to identify the patterns and it, but it, pretty much by asking two questions to images. One, how they understood what uh, algorithms were and how those drawings express an understanding of, of algorithms and two, how they expressed a relationship between people and algorithms. So by asking those two questions to drawings, I started to look for patterns uh, in, in, you know, following guides that have already been published on how to analyze images like this and ended up finding very interesting uh, things that are included in the book if you want to look at uh, those beautiful images. <laughs> This is great, uh, uh, and maybe you 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 draw um, on the work of Tina Buscher, uh, algorithm imaginary. This is a very interesting perspective too, and uh, it, the the rich pictures and uh, and in, in all, all this approach. Remember, can you hear me? Yeah, maybe I I, I was freeze. Um, Remember me, one of the, the, the classical labor studies that from psychology of labor, that's a method that people, uh, the, the researchers record videos uh, um, about the everyday work. And after the, the recording, the video recording, the researchers show to uh, the workers, why do you do, did you do that? Uh, why? Uh, in, in like this kind of confrontation be, uh, um, regarding the the worker in their everyday work and the worker uh, watching the video uh, uh, about uh, um, in while they are working. This is very interesting. This is so creative to think uh, about it. Uh, and one final question I have to you: um, In every research, we have one story that uh, uh, remains in our mind, like an, an anecdote or, or something. Obviously, you are you have many uh, stories to, to, to share with us, or like that phrase that remain in, in your in your brain now. I would like to 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 ask you uh, what story you you can tell us, uh, or what kind of anecdote, just to highlight one uh, for us. Yes, it's it's difficult to choose one, right? But uh, there was something very interesting that I wasn't expecting to find that happened along the, the process. And it was a group of people who started um, to sort of talk about, I think it was Spotify specifically, as if it were um, a, a man, a Costa Rican man, uh, right? So they started to say things like, well, you know, it, it, he he draws too much attention to himself, uh, right? And that made me think of a very a very Costa Rican uh, cultural norm where you're not supposed to bring attention to yourself, right? So Costa Ricans barely protest compared to other Latin American countries um, because for Costa Ricans, it is very important to sort of keep social harmony um, functioning. So they would avoid bringing attention to themselves to uh, keep social harmony. And what I felt was happening there um, was that people were, uh, once again, localizing algorithms. They were forcing algorithms to comply to a local rule of public interaction, um, which I thought was fascinating. But only a couple of minutes later, uh, these very same people were sort of complaining that they didn't have access to certain content that was available uh, in, in other parts of the world. So here they sort of inverted the relationship and instead of localizing algorithms, they wanted algorithms to bring a global experience to their lives, right? So I think this conversation with them and the way they wanted to localize algorithms in certain moments and then wanted to use them to have, uh, they wanted to use them as a technology of proximity 
with the the rest of the world sort of says it all to me right we we uh, that's how we live with algorithms it's not by choosing one way of relating to them but it's by building very complex relationships with algorithms uh, through which we make the local um valuable but also try to be uh cosmopolitan in the way we live our lives um so we should update our understanding of agency based on those realities as opposed to you know just choosing between oh algorithms have all the power in the world or they control every action we do or uh humans have all the agency in the world they control what everything uh, that algorithms do and try to try to come up with much more fluid understandings and even even if it even if it means you know uh, understanding of agency as something that is uh, friction, full of friction, right? Full of tensions and and full of contradictions, uh, because that's how we live our lives, and that's how we live with algorithms. Great, thank you so much, Ignacio, for your uh, your answers, and congrats on on your new book. Uh, and I can share the link for people who would like to. Uh, learn more about this book. One second, I will put the link in the chat so you can read and email uh, Inasa to, to talk about uh, your perceptions and your algorithm perceptions uh, about that. So thank you, uh, uh, Ignacio. Maybe my camera is off one second this is a really yeah please yeah now no, i'm back uh so thank you uh, uh and uh have a good week and good uh book talks uh in, in, in your in the sec sequence no thank you all for for the wonderful questions and for uh, the opportunity to present about this book and hopefully if you get to read it you can uh send me an email and let me know uh what you thought about it thanks again for for the invitation Thank you if for uh, people in the audience. Uh, Friday, we'll have one more uh, online book talk with Sahana Udupa on the brand new book, Digital Unsettling, about colonialism and digital media. Bye-bye. Uh, See you there.